good evening, everyone. Second last lecture in module number one. And you stuck it out so far. Only two more to go with tonight. And um, looking forward to what we're going to share together as we talk about the inspiration of Scripture. And then also as we look at some Bible study uh, method, uh, which has been extremely helpful to me uh, personally. As we start tonight, let me read something from Acts chapter 2. And um, the occasion is the Pentecost or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And Peter gets up and he preaches a, a rather long sermon to a massive big crowd of mostly Jewish people. People who have gathered from all parts of the world. Uh, Jews who ha have been scattered and they have come together in Jerusalem for the feast. And as he comes, as he draws to a close uh, in Acts chapter 2, he says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And that's how it seems like he comes to the end of his sermon. Um, but then immediately following in verse 37, we, we have a response. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other, the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, what I want to highlight is the fact that these people simply responded to a message given by the Apostle Peter. Uh, Peter spoke the Word of God into that situation, uh, driven by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Peter, who previously denied Jesus, now had the power and the authority and the courage to actually speak the Word of God to that whole crowd. And, and these people, many of them, um, there must have been thousands of them because we, we read how several thousand came to know the Lord on that occasion. There, there must have been many more thousands there gathered. And somehow, with Peter speaking the Word of God into that situation, these people responded by receiving the Word of God and something happened with them. Something happened to them that you cannot really explain in human terms. And uh, the word is so striking here. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And one of the questions we may ask is, what actually happened here? Well, of course, we have to ascribe it to God. Um, the fact that the Holy Spirit was poured out on that particular day, the thousands of people who gathered together to come and listen. But when, people spoke, when Peter spoke the word of God, somehow something stirred in the hearts of those people. And one of the answers to the question, what actually happened to them, uh, I believe we find in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. And, and I believe the author of the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, actually gives us a bit of a, a cue, a clue, as to what happened on that day of Pentecost and what has happened ever since then. And why are we actually here? Well, many of us may have grown up in a Christian environment, but still the Word of God penetrated our hearts. Others of you may sit here and you may have a testimony where you were far away from God, not even searching for God, not even thinking about Him. And somehow a verse of scripture or the reading of the word or the explanation of the word in a sermon or a message that came to you just opened your heart and something happened inside of you. You were cut to the heart. And, and that is the power of the word of God, of this book that I have in my hand. There are many organizations who will use only the scriptures in spreading it around the world like placing Bibles in hotel rooms like the Gideons and several other missions organizations or sometimes only portions of the scriptures. And we know that the written word, but also the, the word explained and spoken, uh, as long as it is the word of God, it's amazing how God will operate and work to change lives. I have been 
on the receiving end of the Word of God again and again and again in my life. I think I mentioned this before, but this, this book has never become old to me. I, I'm amazed every day when I read it to find out that God actually speaks to me. Um, I, I don't get that same experience when I read the newspaper a second time or a news article or a novel or something like that. But somehow or the other, there's something in this book that just changes my life on an ongoing basis. It provides me with guidance, provides me with comfort oftentimes. Uh, not that I understand it all, and there are many times when I ask questions, many times when I just don't know. And even then, reading doesn't necessarily help me immediately. But over time, this book, has changed my life. It has changed the lives of many people. Probably most of you here uh, can testify to how this book has changed your life. Now the question is why? Well, one of the answers to that we're going to look tonight because we believe that this book, this Bible, is inspired by God. And that's the topic of our discussion, at least for the first uh, part of our lecture time together. But let's pray together as we thank the Lord for His Word. Father, we want to thank you that you have given us your word. We thank you that Jesus Christ, the living word, came into this world and that you identified with us in our sinfulness, that Jesus died on the cross to take our sins away, that you left us with the record of your revelation, your actions, your acts in history, and that we today, 2,000 years after Christ, can still read about what you have done uh, before and during the time of Christ, and then throughout church history. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the written word. And as we have seen last week, we thank you that, it, that it's available to us in our own language and that we can read it, understand it, and receive it. And bless us tonight as we discuss this particular topic. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned in my prayer just a moment ago, last week we looked at the translation of the Bible, why we actually need translations. Number one, I think it's very logical. Most of us don't read Greek and Hebrew fluently uh, anymore. And then why do we need more English translations or updated English translations? Again, the answer is fairly simple, and that is language changes over time. New words, words take on new meaning. Um, a language is a dynamic thing, and therefore translations of the Bible are necessary. Uh, I've looked at some of the translations of the English Bible. I trust that you have had some time to go and have a look at the introduction of your Bible. That's, that's actually very important. Now, uh, given the information that you received last week, you probably are far better equipped to actually read that introduction and have just a little bit more of an understanding what these people are saying why they're doing a translation, how many worked, when they did it, uh, and, and the philosophy behind their translation, etc., uh, etc. Et and um, I also looked at some of the Bible study resources available, um, and we can talk for hours and hours about the different kinds of resources, and I would encourage you and challenge you, actually, to find out more uh, about the, the Bible study sources and resources that are available for you to use. Now tonight we're going to look at the topic of inspiration. Uh, we do believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, and why do we believe that? And what makes the Bible such a special book? And then as we come to the end of the lecture time today, uh, we're going to look at a Bible study method. And I'll introduce you very practically to one of the methods that I'm personally using, uh, especially as I try and unfold the message of a particular passage. And so we are going to look at the theories of inspiration, some of the views around inspiration. I'll introduce you to some of the language, the vocabulary around that, and then we will look at that Bible study method. If you are doing some reading, either in Johnston or Harris or any other book, then you need to look for the topic, uh, something such as the value of the Bible, inspiration of the scriptures or anything like that. Uh, or revelation and inspiration, which is a whole topic in the book of Harris. And then you'll find those topics also listed in your new Bible dictionary or any other dictionary as words like inspiration, interpretation. 
or hermeneutics and those last two words are going to be the topic of next week's discussion when we come and look at rules and principles of interpretation and the big word for that is the word hermeneutics and so if you look under that topic you will find more about the value of the scriptures and also how we interpret the scriptures I've broken it up into two different sections uh, to introduce us tonight to the inspiration of scripture and then next week we'll look more specifically at some of the rules that we apply in interpreting the Word of God. Now, as we look back, um, just to remind you where we have been coming, because we're now pushing towards the end of our module number one, an introduction of the Bible. So in that first week, we did look at the introduction of the Bible, some of the genres, uh, and we have just looked very briefly at the 66 books of the Bible and broken them down into different genres. In the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the historical books, the wisdom literature, the prophetic literature. Uh, and then in the New Testament, we have the Gospels, the Book of Acts, letters or epistles, and then the Book of Revelation. We also looked in the second lecture at the topic of the canon of Scripture. Why those 66 books? We looked at the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, um, but we determined that through our church history, those 66 books were regarded as uh, God's Word. We looked at the biblical history from about 2000 BC to 150 AD, uh, and we did that in two lectures. The second lecture, we gave attention to the intertestamental history and whatever happened in preparation for the coming of Jesus the Messiah. And then two weeks ago, we looked at Bible transmission, textual criticism, and that is how do we know that the actual text of the Bible is correct and authoritative and trustworthy? And then last week we looked at the theory and practice of Bible translation and we gave specific attention to some of the English translations and the whole range of translations that uh, is available for us. Now before we go any further, I would like for you to take a pen and write down all the names of the books of the New Testament. All the names of the books of the New Testament. If you do a count, you can do it somewhere in the margin on your notes. Um, use abbreviations and... Um, you need to count up 27 of them. It starts with Matthew. <laughs> ends with Revelation. There's those middle epistles that normally throw us a little bit. Um, and if you want to check your work, either in your Bible or just listen carefully, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. That's not too difficult. And then the largest or the longest, one of the longest books of Paul Romans, then 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then Colossians, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, no, not Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, and then Colossians, and Philippians, Philippians and Colossians. I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful I'm not taking the test tonight. In other words, don't listen to me. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and then 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, uh, Philemon, and Hebrews. James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. All right, we're going to look at the inspiration of the Scriptures and understanding some of the concepts and the debates around the inspiration uh, of the Bible or the Scriptures. I think at the outset or from the outset, we need to understand that we're talking here about God and human involvement, divine and human involvement when it comes to the putting together or the pr producing of the Bible uh, as it were. By now, or up to this point in time, we have given quite a bit of attention to the human processes like the history of Israel, um, the textual criticism, which is a science used by modern scholars. Uh, we have looked at translation and, and all of those things, and even the putting together of the canon of the Bible. There was a huge amount of human activity in all of that. Tonight, we are going to look more at the role that God played uh, in putting together the Bible as we know it today, and yet even then we have to acknowledge that we have both a divine and a human element in the production or the producing of the Bible over time. And so some of the questions, why do we believe that God speaks to us through the Bible? And you would have seen that when a pastor, a preacher is on the, in the pulpit and waves the Bible around and says, this is the Word of God, or everything that we believe is based on the Word of God, and so on. Why, why do we even say that? And then are other spiritual books also inspired? And what is so special about the Bible? 
Now, I'm not going to necessarily answer every single question, but at the end of the time together, I hope that I have answered some of these questions and you would be able to uh, put that together in your own mind. Uh, The church over all of the years needed to grapple with this issue. Why do we say that the books in the Bible are special, elevated to a different plane or a level, where we actually start talking about the inspiration of Scripture? This is the Word of God. I mean, you have heard that statement again and again and again. So why are we saying that this is the Word of God? So the church really grappled with that over time. And, and of course, there, there's, um, there's always been those who uh, were critical of the Word of God and put it a- alongside any other book, like the Apocrypha or some of the Pseudepigrapha. Not long ago, there was this huge hoo-ha uh, about uh, another gospel that was discovered, the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of this or that. And, and these, these gospels will probably appear or discover, be discovered or rediscovered over time. And, and we don't ever place them at, on the same basis or the same level as that of the Bible. And why? And, and this is what the church has done for many, many years. Grappling with this, uh, coming up with statements of faith as the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I introduced to you last week, put together in 1646. And uh, we have actually read this uh, last time as well, but that extract from uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which says, The oldest men in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek, being immediately inspired by God, and by His singular care and providence kept pure in all ages, are therefore authentic. Now that's a a huge statement to make, and a statement I personally believe to be true. Uh, But why do we say that? And that is really what we are going to look at tonight. Now if you approach your church, or your denomination, if you come from a denominational type church, your church, your local church, or your denomination will have a statement of faith. And uh, there are many of those around. In fact, every church probably has one. And it may not be a bad thing if you've never seen it to actually ask your pastor to give you a copy of your, uh, your statement of faith. At Rosebank Union Church, and this is really just one example of many that I could have used, there is also uh, a statement in the statement of faith uh, which includes a statement uh, about the Bible. In fact, there are many articles. They, they normally come by way of articles or points or numbers or paragraphs. Um, in the Rosebank Union Churches one, they have articles. And article number two says, and it's under the heading we believe in, and then the, the different things. Article number two says we believe in the Scripture that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are inspired by God and are therefore trustworthy and authoritative in all matters of faith and conduct. Now, there's a, quite a mouthful, and we can unpack that uh, just very briefly. Number one, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It is inspired by God. This is what most evangelical Christians believe. It also is trustworthy. In other words, we can trust the information Uh, and the guidelines that we find in the Bible. It is authoritative, and that is a massive word if you really come to think of it. In in other words, I need to listen when the Bible is being read or when I read the Bible. It is authoritative. It It can point me in certain directions, even when I want to kick against that. It is authoritative. And then it is authoritative in all matters of faith and conduct. In other words, what we believe, my faith, and the way I behave, my conduct. And, and the Bible determines the things I believe and determines the things I do or do not do. Not that the Bible is necessarily a legal book that we use and, and in do, do's and don'ts, but the Bible guides us by way of principles, especially New Testament Christians are guided by the principles that we find in the Scriptures for our daily living as well. Now that's just one single example, and as I said, Uh, If you ask your church, uh, or any other church for that matter, you will be able to look at their statement of faith. And I can almost guarantee you that there is going to be some statement about the Bible in your, your church's statement of faith. When we define inspiration, we've got to start with the Bible itself. There is a key passage in the Bible... Uh, we find it in 2, Corinthians, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. My personal uh, memory is not that great, as, you just, as you've just seen and, and uh, testified. Uh, 
Uh, so the one, one way in which I try and remember this, verse 16 is in the middle of this. And so 3 verse 16, John 3 16 is a verse that most of us know very well. God so loved the world that he gave his only son and so on and so on. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 16 is a very, very important verse that we use in the Bible. It's not the only verse, but it really gives us a good summary of our uh, understanding of the inspiration of Scripture. Let's read from verses 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom, whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, important word, Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, as we saw earlier on in Acts chapter 2 and confirmed in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, the scriptures speak into our lives and it's the scriptures who help us understand who God is, who, who I am in relation to God, that I'm a sinner lost in my sin and, and rebelliousness and that it's only by the grace of God and through the death of Jesus on the cross that I can be saved. And so the scriptures point me in the direction of Jesus Christ. There's an important statement that Paul is making right there. And then he says this in verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man or the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so Paul has something to say to Timothy, not only about the scriptures in terms of the essence of the scriptures, but also the outworking of the scriptures. The more we receive the word of God, the scriptures, the more we will be equipped to do what God wants us to do. Because the scriptures will teach us, it will sometimes rebuke us, it will correct us when we go wrong, it will train us on an ongoing basis which really means, and now I'm preaching, but it really means that we need to allow the Scriptures to impact our lives. Uh, we, we cannot put the Bible on a shelf and live our own lives in a particular direction thinking we are just going to be guided in everything that we need to do. Uh, it is through the Word of God that God speaks to us. And it's no, it's no small thing that we use the title, The Word of God. God speaks through the Bible to us. And therefore, we need to allow the Word of God to play a, 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 a central role in our lives. Now, the word God breathed that we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, is a Greek word. I don't often uh, use Greek or Hebrew to impress people unless I tell you. I'm now going to try and impress you. But, but this is such an important word that, that we really just need to stop for a moment and look at it. The word is theopneustos. And uh, you can see the theos in that word right at the beginning, which, is, which means God. And the literal translation of theopneustos in 2 Timothy 3.16 is God breathed. Uh, it's in the NIV translated theos and pneuma or pneu, uh, pneo, which means to breathe. It's related to pneuma, which is spirit or wind or breath or something like that. So God breathed or breathing out. The word literally means to breathe out. God breathed out the words. It's breathed out by God. The Bible dictionary, the New Bible dictionary, uh, says that Paul's words mean not, a, not that Scripture is inspiring, although it is, of course it is inspiring, but that Scripture is a divine product. So there are many things that inspire us, and artists will tell you that they may look at a, a picture of nature or a scene of nature and they feel so inspired that they want to uh, paint that or they want to uh, maybe do a poem on it or uh, I may be inspired by a book that I'm reading. But we're not talking about that kind of inspiration here. We're talking about something completely divine. And this is God breathing out words, speaking words, and those words eventually ending up in the scriptures written down for us, and therefore the Bible is inspired. It was not the human authors that were inspired as such, although they were definitely inspired, but the actual written product. And there is a difference, not just were uh, Paul and Peter and others inspired, and they were inspired, but, but the product that they put together, and ultimately the Bible that came to us and that we now hold in our hands, that product is inspired by God.
This word, inspiration, comes from the Latin and the King James translation. Theopneustos is rendered in the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. We looked at that last week and the week before. Um, and the word is divinitus inspirata, which means divinely breathed uh, into. Some modern English translations opt for God-breathed, like the NIV we have just read, or breathed out by God, which is the, uh, um, the English standard version, ESV, avoiding the word inspiration altogether since the connotation, unlike the Latin root, leans towards breathing in rather than breathing out. And so it is not God breathing into the Bible, it is God breathing out the words and human beings receiving God's words and then writing them down and we'll look at, the, at all the theories of inspiration around that also a little bit later. And, and this, this whole question about the balance between divine and human activity when we talk about uh, the Word of God. When we start or try and define inspiration, I find a quote from Milne, Bruce Milne, uh, to know the truth. And, and the, the books are listed at the end uh, of the notes tonight. But he quotes theologian Carl F.H. Henry, who writes... Inspiration is a supernatural influence upon the divinely chosen prophets and apostles whereby the Spirit of God assures the truth and trustworthiness of their oral and written proclamation. Furthermore, the writers were divinely superintended by the Holy Spirit in the choice of words they used. Although some things were dictated to the writers, most of the time the Spirit simply superintended the writing so that the writer using his own words wrote what the spirit wanted and already we're beginning to uh, to folk to not focus on but to to touch on the whole theory of inspiration in other words as christians and and also as jews by the way but as christians in terms of the bible we do not believe that god uh, dictated it or wrote it all down and dropped it down from heaven somewhere in a, in a cave or something and it was discovered by someone. In fact, God used very human processes to put the Bible together. We have now seen that again and again. And the canon, putting together of the canon in, um, in the textual criticism we looked at, and then last week in the translation as well. Now we're taking one step back. We come back to how the Bible actually originated. And it originated in the mind of God he inspired people. He breathed out words and thoughts and ideas. They received it somehow or the other, but they used their own human faculties, their own human abilities and characteristics and abilities and cultural knowledge. They, they, they didn't show uh, supernatural knowledge beyond their years or beyond their own culture or anything like that. They wrote with their own abilities, with, uh, locked into their own cultural time and using words that normal human beings would be able to understand. And, and that is how inspiration works uh, to some degree. So by way of conclusion, when, when we look at just the definition of inspiration, it is clear that the Bible is a special book, and therefore our reference to the Word of God, God's words. God inspired or breathed out the words, but He used normal human beings as His instruments. God not only inspired the initial process, but as we have now seen, he also protected that whole process of, of protecting the Bible and ultimately to the point where today we have the Word of God and we believe that it is inspired by God. There's some key concepts when we talk about the inspiration uh, debate that I just want to introduce to you. I'm not going to elaborate. Um, again, this, this particular topic can take up a whole semester at a theological institution uh, where students will study inspiration for a whole semester long at least, uh, one of the systematic theology t uh, topics. But the technical language, when you study this topic of inspiration, you realize that there's a minefield of technical terms that needs to be uh, understood. Some biblical scholars become very passionate about using a particular correct terminology. And if you don't use those particular words, they get all uptight about that. You don't believe in the Word of God and so on. Uh, I, I'm, I'm less stressed about those kind of things uh, because not everybody necessarily agrees on every single little word when it comes to uh, this particular uh, doctrine. But the, the, the theory and the understanding of the inspiration of Scripture uh, I feel very passionate about. It is worth just giving 
uh, some attention to some of those words uh, which I want to introduce to you. One of the words, the first one I want to introduce to you is the word inerrant or inerrancy. We say the Bible is inerrant. The inerrancy of Scripture means that Scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. And this is another book that I'm using actually later in, in, uh, in the year, in the last module. Uh, it's a brief summary of Wayne Grudem's systematic theology book. Um, and, and essentially it boils down to the fact that the Bible is without error. The Bible is not wrong. Now, you can point out certain things in the Bible. You can tell me, well, the, the Bible says the sun rises. Nowadays, with our scientific knowledge, we know the sun doesn't rise. The, the earth turns. Well, if that is true... Why are you still talking about the sun that is rising? It's a way of speaking. So the Bible is not wrong in saying the Bible, uh, the sun rises or the sun sets. Uh, it is a way of speaking. Uh, and as I have pointed out, the authors of the Bible spoke and wrote in language and with cultural understanding and insights that were common to them at their particular time. We have obviously scientifically moved on uh, in many different directions and we know a lot more about some things, but a lot less about other things, I would assume. The other word is infallible. The Bible cannot fail. The word means it cannot fail. The Bible cannot fail in regards to its purpose of introducing us to God and His plan of salvation. It will not lead us in the wrong direction. And in that sense, the Bible is infallible. It will not ever fail us. Uh, if, if a person is searching for God and you place a Bible in that person's hands or you introduce them to the Scriptures, the Bible will bring them to God and to salvation through Jesus Christ um, and, and, and His death on the cross. Uh, and in that sense, the Bible is infallible and it will not fail us. Reliable, I think most of us probably know this is not... Uh, there's no need to really uh, expand, but the Bible is trustworthy in all the words and its intentions, and therefore I can trust the Bible. I can trust the Bible from cover to cover, and I believe the Bible from cover to cover. Another word that I want to introduce to you is the word plenary. The word refers to all of Scripture, and you may find this in statements of faith where they talk about the plenary inspiration. In other words, every single thing in the Bible is inspired. Now, immediately someone will put up his hand and say, well, there are times when the devil speaks. We have actual words of the devil. I mean, right, Job chapter 1, the devil appears before God. Some mystery there, I cannot really explain, but somehow the devil, uh, Satan, he's mentioned in the Hebrew there, he appears before God and he speaks. Also, Job's friends speak um, huge amounts of, of words and times uh, to Job. Now, is every word there true? Is what the devil says true? Is what the devil says to Jesus when he tempts Jesus, is that true? No, it's not. But it, it gives us a picture of what the devil said to God in Job chapter 1 or how the devil uh, tempted Jesus uh, in the Gospels. It doesn't mean what the devil is saying is true. It means that in the context of describing the incident, in that sense the Bible is true. And in that sense the whole of the Bible is inspired. Uh, we therefore talk about the plenary inspiration of the Scriptures. The word sola, sola scriptura is the Latin for Scripture alone. And we need no more or nothing less than what is in the Bible for our belief and faith. Somewhere in the weeks past, uh, I have read from Revelation, the very last chapter, something about don't add anything and don't take anything away from this book of the prophecy. It's, it relates, first of all, to the book of Revelation. But I believe we can apply that same statement to the whole of Scripture. And therefore, there's no one book in the Bible that is more important than any other book in the Bible. In the sense that we need to see the whole picture. Now, of course, some books in the Bible will speak to us more directly and clearly and, and Christian-like than other books in the Bible. When you, when we, if we only had Leviticus, we would have major difficulty understanding Jesus because Leviticus doesn't speak about Jesus directly. It may have foreshadowing of what Jesus eventually came to fulfill, but we would, we would also not understand Jesus properly unless we had a, 
an understanding of Leviticus back in the Old Testament. So at the end of the day, we talk about the Scripture. What we have in the Scripture is absolutely sufficient. Another word that I will introduce to you uh, in a moment. The Bible is also has final authority. We call in the Bible and not anything else for our belief. We, we believe that the Bible is ultimately what we need to believe. There are plenty of statements of faith. Many church traditions uh, accept certain statements of faith as uh, guidance and help, uh, and they even would, would, would hold to them and say we cannot change those statements of faith. Other church traditions will say, well, we have a statement of faith, but, but the Bible is ultimately the most important, and, and Christians around the world will, will actually agree on that. There are some variations of this, especially when you, when you move into big denominations or churches where there may be an individual who claims to, be, to have some authority or even the same authority as the, as the Scriptures. But in the evangelical tradition around the world, you will have people always saying that the Bible has final authority. And then the word I used earlier on, uh, in the context of sola scriptura, um, the Bible is sufficient. Uh, we believe in the sufficiency of the Scriptures. The Bible is sufficient for belief and practice. We need no more revelation of God or about salvation. And that's a very, very, very important statement, especially when you start moving around and people start claiming that they have received additional revelation from God and God told me to tell you sort of language. Uh, then it becomes very difficult. My response normally is, well, um, I, I, will, I will read the scriptures and I will allow God to speak to me. And if what you are saying to me is true, then it will be confirmed by the scriptures. But I believe that the scriptures are sufficient for my life and my practice. I don't need more than that. I need explanation of that. I need interpretation of many things in the Bible as we looked at it, as we saw last week. And we will look at it again later today. That's why we listen to, to sermons and so on. But at the end of the day, the Bible is the only authority and it is sufficient for everything that we need. Now, what does the Bible say about inspiration? I've talked a whole lot, um, apart from quoting 2 Timothy 3:16 uh, or 14 to 17, uh, which is an important passage to refer to. But the Bible has a lot to say about its own inspiration. When you go to the Old Testament, it is, there was a clear belief that God spoke to mankind. Now, that's a statement of faith. I believe that God speaks to us, that God spoke to humanity. Now, that's a, 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 it's, it's a wonderful statement, but not everybody necessarily believes it. Some people believe that God created it all, and He left, and He left the world to, to, to itself. Um, there are those who believe that God created it all, we, we can't know Him. Um, uh, agnostics don't believe that we can know God. Atheists don't even believe in God. But there are those who believe that God simply put it all into place, and then He left, and He's no longer involved. When, it, when we read the scriptures, we, we find a very different picture. We find a God who is intimately involved in his creation. In Genesis chapter 1, he created Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 2, he created uh, Eve uh, as a helpmate for Adam. And he set them free in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, God is coming to the Garden of Eden, even though he knew that Adam and Eve had fallen into sin. God was still pursuing them. He could have, right there, He could have turned His back on them. He could have said, well, this is it. Wipe them out. Let's start all over. But He didn't. God pursued Adam and Eve. And that's the story of the Bible. The, the Bible tells us that God pursues us. And therefore, God speaks to us. Uh, in Samuel, 1 Samuel, uh, little Samuel, he has an audible voice. Uh, not something that I've ever heard from God, by the way. I wish I could, but maybe I'll skrik so groot that I probably won't uh, uh, even want to hear his voice. Um, but, but Samuel somehow heard this audible voice, and he heard God speaking to him. And, and it just goes to show that, that God pursues humanity, humankind. And this is the way it says on uh, leaderhue.com. It says, the clear intent of the Old Testament writers was, was to convey God's message. God's message. Consider first that God was said to speak to the people. God says, thus says the Lord, I have put my words in your mouth. The word of the Lord came to him. All these references to God speaking show that he is interested in communicating with us verbally. The Old Testament explicitly states 3,808 times that, 
that it is conveying the express words of God. Now, if you don't get it, after 3,000 times, you will never get it. The Old Testament says God speaks. And ultimately, the Old Testament uh, believes, Old Testament authors believe that God spoke, and the, the Old Testament itself became the words of God. The New Testament, Jesus confirms his belief that the Old Testament, or the Scriptures as he would refer to them, um, that, that he believed in them. Many, many times he did so. He often quoted from it. He referred to its authority. And even when he was tempted, and I referred to the devil and the devil coming to Jesus, and he said, well, it, you, it, the, the Bible says well, it is written to do this. And then Jesus responded by saying, it is also written. And then he was able to counter the temptations of the devil. The gospel writers clearly saw the Old Testament referring to Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, the book of Matthew, for example, uh, which we will look at in more depth in the third module, if you hang around that long, uh, in, in, in the book of Matthew, it is very clear uh, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And several times, Old Testament uh, passages are quoted verbatim to show how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. And it's simply believed that the Old Testament was the, the Word of God. The other New Testament authors, like in the... Um, in the epistles, not only in the gospels, um, not only is the Old Testament quoted, but they themselves saw uh, them themselves speaking on behalf of and on, on the authority of God, and that Jesus Christ or God was speaking through them into a particular situation. Uh, the very well-known communion words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I have received from the Lord what I also convey or transfer uh, to you. And then he goes on to talk about the Lord's Supper. And so Paul saw himself as speaking authoritatively into certain situations. There are times when he quotes Jesus, when he quotes the Scriptures, and he says, this is what the Bible says, not the Bible, this is what the Word of God is, this is what Jesus said. There are times when he contrasts that slightly with some of his own interpretation uh, of that. But the, uh, the, the fact is that in the New Testament, the authors very clearly understood themselves as speaking on behalf of God. When it comes to the New Testament using the Old Testament, I need to point out, first of all, that most of the New Testament quotes are from the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. Um, but there was no distinction in their minds. They didn't say, we're quoting from the Septuagint or we're quoting from the Hebrew. For them, it was simply the Scriptures, whatever translation they were using. And there are a total of 283 direct quotes from the Old Testament and over 2,000 additional direct or indirect references to the Old Testament. So the New Testament affirms the fact that the Old Testament is the Word of God. And then the New Testament's use of and references to the Old Testament clearly indicates an understanding by those authors, New Testament authors, that God was speaking through the words of the Scriptures. This same principle applies to the New Testament itself as the early church over time came to an understanding of how God was speaking through the New Testament writings. We don't have time to go into that, but the early church fathers very, very early started quoting New Testament as the Word of God equal with the Old Testament scriptures as well. And that story can go on right throughout Christian history, church history, we refer to it. Church leaders and theologians throughout the ages seldom doubted the fact that God spoke to mankind and that the Bible is the written word of God. In spite of many, many false beliefs, uh, we have looked at only one of them in the early uh, parts of the second century when Marcion started cutting out certain parts of the Bible and believed that Paul uh, was the only one who really had an understanding of the gospel and so on. In spite of all those false beliefs and attacks, there is a golden thread right throughout church history that says the Bible is the inspired word of God. It is actually in the 18th century, during the time of the Enlightenment, when there was a far more critical approach to the Bible. Last week, or two weeks ago rather, I introduced you to textual criticism. I used the word lower criticism and higher criticism. And I said that textual criticism functions as a lower critique of the Bible. In other words, it's looking at the text of the Bible and whether we can, can trust the actual words in the Bible. Higher criticism is saying, um, are these words actually true? So it's not, are they, are they trustworthy, are they correct? It is the question, are they actually true? 
Can we even believe them? Did Jesus actually say all these words and so on? And did Paul really write 2 Timothy? And, and so the arguments go on and on. Now that is in the realm of what we call higher criticism. And it was rife during the Enlightenment years. And we still see the after effect of that. In fact, the whole of Europe, uh, Germany, uh, uh, the Netherlands, uh, and to some extent uh, England and places in America have been affected by liberal theology where people started critiquing the Bible and whether we can even believe it. And the end result is churches that are draining uh, and, and, be, and, and going empty. Uh, that, that is the, the history of Europe because of liberalism that, that crept in. Uh, when people do not have a high view of Scripture, is another word that we often use. I have a high view of Scripture. I believe that it is the Word of God. I believe God speaks through the Word. I believe it is authoritative. I believe it is the guidance that I need for my life. When people don't believe that anymore, then there is very little to believe. Uh, and you can start going all over the place in your belief. And the, the ultimate result of that is churches uh, go empty. Church leaders have responded in many ways to the Enlightenment and to the critical beliefs or critical teachings around the Bible or liberal teachings around the Bible. Uh, and it has res uh, resulted in, in many, many different statements of faith uh, around the Bible and around the inspiration of Scripture. I want to refer to one of them that became almost like a, a landmark. And many people in the evangelical tradition will refer to what has become known uh, as the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy. A meeting of the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy uh, is an, in an interdenominational joint effort by hundreds of evangelical scholars. It was held in Chicago in 1978 to defend biblical inerrancy and against a trend towards liberal conceptions of Scripture. This meeting agreed on a joint statement, and it's a very long statement. And what I'm going to do, uh, it looks rather long even in your notes tonight, but I can guarantee you this is a summary of the ultimate result of that uh, particular meeting. And this is what you find. And you can go and read the whole statement if you wish online because it is all there. And it's in several websites, but the one that I'm quoting is Spurgeon.org. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to give you an extract. And uh, again, there are five articles, and I'll just briefly refer to them. Article number one, God, who is himself truth and speaks truth only, has inspired Holy Scripture in order thereby to reveal himself to lost mankind through Jesus Christ as creator and Lord, redeemer and judge. Holy Scripture is God's witness of himself. Um, in another way in which we say that is, this is God's self-revelation. God took the initiative to reveal himself, to speak to us, and to initiate that whole process. Article number two. Holy Scripture, being God's very own word, written by men, prepared and superintended by his spirit, there's that word superintended again, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. Now, that's also an important statement. The Bible doesn't touch on every single subject. The Bible didn't tell me some years ago, 33, in fact, 34 almost, that I need to go and marry Joan. Joan's name does not appear in the Bible at all. But I, have, I was able to read Scripture over a long period of time. I was attracted to her from a personal human perspective. And over time, I came to the conclusion that this can be and should be my wife. And we have been married ever since. Now, that is a principal thing that I find in Scripture, but the Bible doesn't say go and marry X, Y, Z, or move to this town or move to that town. There are guidance and principles found in Scripture. So this, this statement is, is very important. It is true on, on every matter upon which it touches. It is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it affirms, obeyed as God's command, and in all that it requires. It needs to be embraced as God's pledge in all that it promises. And then article number three, the Holy Spirit, Scripture's divine author, both authenticates it to us by his inward witness and opens our minds to understand its meaning. We're moving slightly in a, another realm now because we, we're moving from reading what is in the Bible, the pages of the Bible, to the Holy Spirit's activity within me and you, as we read and interpret, the Holy Spirit uh, 
makes clear to us what we should be doing and how we should be applying these truths to our own lives. Statement number four. Being holy and verbally God-given, Scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching, no less than what it states about God's acts in creation, about the events of world history, and about its own literary origins under God, than, it, than in its witness to God's saving grace in individual lives. In the Bible we find God's plan of salvation. And then article number five, the authority of Scripture is inescapably impaired if this total divine inerrancy is in any way limited or disregarded. And that's precisely what happens from a liberal point of view. Uh, questions about the Bible, cutting out this, cutting out that. Uh, there was some kind of movement some years ago among scholars to determine which of the words in the Gospels we really can believe to be from Jesus. And they cut it down to some 10% or 5% of all of the words, all of the words of Jesus in the New Testament. Now, the moment you start doing that, you're on not just shaky ground, you're on tumbling ground, because that is where it starts coming uh, apart. How does inspiration actually work, though, when you, when you start thinking about it and trying to put it all together? How did God get His Word to us in written form? And this is where we will be giving some attention to the theories of inspiration, and I will do that after we have taken a short break. So we're going to look at the theories of inspiration after the break. Now, like anything, people obviously have theories and debates around how inspiration worked in the past. And um, important for us to maybe just look very briefly at some of these theories of inspiration uh, to find out how inspiration is seen by different people or different scholars. It may not bother you much or disturb you at all. Maybe you never gave this a second thought even, but I will... Uh, introduce you to that anyway. And the whole debate, as I said earlier on, is between the divine and the human. What, what sort of ratio, if you wish, uh, happened uh, or was used in order to produce the Bible as we know it today? So let's look at a couple of the uh, inspirations uh, theories, and I'm, I'm just going to hit the, the headings of each one. There is a so-called mechanical uh, inspiration in this view, God did all or most of the work, and he simply used the authors as writing instruments. Uh, either he dropped it down from heaven, uh, or he dictated it, and someone just took it all down. It's literally uh, God speaking and someone listening and just writing down anything. Now, we have a couple of references in the Bible to that, um, in the likes of Moses on Mount Sinai, perhaps, where God gave him the Ten Commandments or dictated certain things and Moses needed to write all of that down. Um, in this particular theory, uh, all of the Bible happened like that. And uh, the human being then becomes a passive instrument, almost like um, I'm just sitting there, I have a pen in my hand and, and God does the writing through my hand sort of thing. Now, I'm exaggerating, but, but in this theory... The human faculty, human ability, human uh, capabilities are bypassed and God produces it all. As nice and convenient as it sounds, and I wish it was that, that easy, uh, this theory re really just allows too little uh, room for the role of, of human uh, authors in the whole process. There is a so-called dualistic theory. Supporters of this view argue that both God and human beings had some part and play in putting together the Bible. There are sections in the Bible where God is at work, uh, and God speaks and God writes, maybe using a human, but he dictates. There are other parts where, uh, like uh, the history of Israel, for example, is being put together by some human being, purely writing history, and God plays very little role in that. I think you can almost see the danger of this view because it's up to us then to determine which parts of the Bible came directly from God and which came from the human side and, and how that combination works. And so there's some danger in that particular view as well. There is a so-called dy dynamic inspiration. Uh, there was the core of the scriptures came uh, via God and inspiring certain people. People wrote it down, uh, the core of that, but over time, 100 a thousand years or two thousand years, um, other authors and editors came along and they edited and added and so it was a whole dynamic process of expanding and always and ever expanding, not, not just adding more books but actually adding more words 
to the original words that were written down. And in this view, there's too much emphasis on the participation and role of human beings, and it creates the impression that the original author's works were changed uh, over time. So even that theory uh, doesn't go down too well. There is the organic inspiration view, and in this view, uh, God revealed himself and his purposes to human beings with or without their conscious knowledge. And that's a very, very important statement. So it's not as if Paul necessarily sat down and said, today I'm going to write the Bible. Um, the, I, I, when I was much younger, there was a, a, a singer, a Christian singer, uh, Keith Green, and he died, he, he uh, tragically died in an in a airplane crash. Uh, but there was a song that he sings about uh, the Jews coming out of Egypt, and they're in the desert. Uh, and they start complaining about the manna. And they said, all we, all we see every day is manna. And this is the song, the, how the song goes. Manna in the morning, manna in the afternoon, manna in the evening. We have to eat hammer, han, manna hamburgers and, and manna pizzas and manna this and manna everything. And what does Moses do? Moses sits around and writes the Bible. And so they were complaining about Moses sitting and writing the Bible. Now, I'm not sure that Moses consciously always knew that he was writing the Bible. But... When you look back in retrospect, Moses and Paul and, and others were actually writing the Bible, but they weren't always conscious of that particular fact. Now, God's word is true and reliable, and he used human authors with their own language, their own culture, their own insights, and their own personalities to convey his truth to his people. And when you come back to the final module, if you want to stick around that long, then we're going to look at the way that God revealed himself. And, and God's revelation, one of the key concepts in God's revelation is what we call progressive revelation. God did not reveal every single thing to Moses. God did not tell Moses or Abraham or David, uh, for example, I'm, I'm going to send Jesus into this world. He's going to be born of Mary. And he is going to live for 33 years. And then he's going to die on the cross uh, for the sins of the world. He, he didn't reveal all of that. What, what he did reveal to Moses was, you need a system whereby you will get forgiveness. You need the sacrificial system. You need some uh, legal requirements in order to function as a nation. And what God was doing is progressively revealing more and more and more of himself until Jesus came into this world. And we believe that Jesus is God's final revelation. And even then, the authors of the New Testament needed to come to that understanding over a period of time. As they grappled with this, now of course God revealed himself, Jesus revealed himself, but they needed to come to an understanding of that with their own human minds as to who Jesus was. And therefore we talk about speaking to and into their own culture and cultural times as well. The Bible is therefore God's revelation communicated to us in human language. God did not use another language, he used Hebrew, which was a spoken language. Aramaic a little bit later on, Greek, and now today, we, in a translation, God can still communicate with us. He doesn't have to speak to us in some kind of a, a strange language. And this view uh, may not be perfect, but it certainly is closer to uh, the truth. There's another way in which one can put this. Uh, in fact, I want to quote this from uh, Bruce Milne's book, uh, To Know the Truth, and um, it's called Supervised Inspiration. And he says, in the process of inspiration, God sovereignly supervised and ordered the background, heredity, the circumstances of the individual writers. As a result, when they recorded events, meditations, or sermons in writing, the words used were consciously the free comp composition of the authors and at the same time the very word of God. Now there's a mystery here. How, how the word of words of man and the Word of God connect, that is a mystery to us, and it will probably remain a mystery. Hence, the theories of inspiration. But my personal view is that the last two, uh, organic and supervised inspiration, come closer to the truth to what I personally believe uh, the Bible to be. By way of conclusion, there are many variations of the different theories, but the so-called organic and supervised theories uh, come come close uh, the closest to recognizing God's role in revealing his words uh, the breathing out of God of his word or words uh, 
as well as the human author's role in recording their understanding of God's words. And therefore, the Bible does not speak some kind of a, a heavenly language, which is way beyond us. It speaks a human language uh, in the words and in the context given by those human authors whenever they lived, whether it's 1,500 years B.C. or 100 years A.D. They, they speak the kind of common language that people are able to understand. We recognize that as with all theology, we are limited in our human understanding. And that's what I refer to as the mystery of how these two things really connect. What is the divine and what is the human aspects in the Bible? When it comes to references in Scripture... Just to elaborate a little bit more on that, 2 Timothy 3.16 is a key verse on the inspiration, and um, I have already mentioned that. 2 Peter chapter 1, um, verses 19 to 21 is another very, very important passage that we uh, may just need to look at quickly. And Peter says, And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it. As to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Very interesting way in which Peter uh, puts this. Uh, men were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and I'm not going to elaborate on that, but Jesus Christ is God's final word. And, and wherever um, anything does not relate to Christ or expands on Christ or focuses on Jesus Christ, we should reject that. Anything related to Christ, uh, and that's what the Bible is about. Ultimately, the Bible is about the coming of Jesus into this world, which will lead to the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is the culmination of everything that God has in store uh, for this world. And we refer, often refer to Jesus as the living word, and we refer to the Bible as the written word of God. And the written word of God takes us to the living word of God, who is Jesus. John 10, 34 and 32, 36, Jesus believed in God's eternal word. You can, you can have, go and have a look at that. 2 Peter 3, um, I've referred to this um, in another context as well, uh, but let me just read that. He says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Using Paul's wisdom, but it's a supernatural wisdom given to him by God. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Now, interesting, when Peter refers to Paul's letters, he, he equates it with other scriptures. Now, in a negative way, because people distort the scriptures and they distort Paul's letters as well. So Peter is equating Paul's letters to that of scriptures, and we know how the Jews uh, regarded their scriptures very highly. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, and Luke chapter 10, verse 7, in the exact same context, and thereby equating a New Testament writing with an Old Testament uh, scripture as well. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, Paul affirmed his view that his own writings were uh, inspired by God. And perhaps uh, this is a good one to, to have a look at. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 37. And Paul says, Did the word of God originate with you? Verse 36. Or are you the only people it reached? If anybody thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. Now, you can't have it more direct than that, where Paul believed that what he was writing to the Corinthians was actually God's command, the Lord's command, God's word, in other words, uh, to them. The importance of inspiration. The Word of God is alive and it changes both the non-believer and the believer's life. It is, it is speaking the Word of God, reading the Word of God, uh, explaining the Word of God to another person, to an unbeliever, that the Holy Spirit uses those words to bring enlightenment to their lives, to change them from darkness 
uh, to light. Uh, and in the believer's life, uh, the, the, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, uses the Word of God to continue to change me, which is why I need to allow the Word of God to impact my life. I can only do that by reading and studying it on a regular basis, listening to messages or sermons uh, on that. Our own attitude and approach to the Bible impact. Uh, the way we respond to its message. We, when you come to the Bible believing it is the Word of God, you will hear the voice of God speaking. If you don't believe that, if you're an atheist and you say, well, this is all rubbish, I don't believe it's true, it's not going to speak to you unless some lightning bolt strikes you one day, which is also possible. It may happen, it, and it has happened to people, but, but especially from a Christian perspective, if I approach the Word of God as the Word of God, I will hear the Word of God. And more often than not, when I, when I have a quiet time, I pray and I say, Lord, this, this is your word. I mean, just listen to the wording. This is your word. And as I read it, speak to me. And more often than not, God is faithful and he does speak to me. Sometimes it's lightning bolt stuff. Other times it's pure daily discipline and devotion where on an ongoing basis you read. You may not have some wow moment at that particular time, but over time, the Lord is able to use those scriptures that you have read, sometimes out of pure discipline, um, and, and, and to use it in your life, to give you wisdom, to give you insight, to, to, uh, to bring a, a particular memory uh, to mind, something you've read maybe some time ago. The Bible is the basis of our faith. Everything we believe stands or falls on the basis of this truth. The written word leads us to the living word, Jesus Christ. And, and the way we introduce other people to God's word determines our impact on them as well. I may have said this to you before, but as a, as a pastor, I've seen this many, many, many times, especially when people are going through major struggles and, and, and difficulties. In the case of death, for example, I have seen again and again where my words, I'm trying to counsel, I'm trying to use the normal cliches, you know, don't worry, do this, uh, whatever, uh, it will get better, you know, the sun will shine again tomorrow, all those kind of things. Actually, uh, I don't even use those words anymore. More often than not, I say to people, I have nothing to say to you. But what I can do is I can read you a scripture. And I have seen people sobbing, which they should be doing because they're grieving. And when you take out the word of God and you start just simply just reading it to them, you see the calmness uh, into that situation. I've seen it at funerals from the pulpit uh, regularly where, where I, uh, I see people crying and, you know, with all the eulogies and, and tributes and everything. People um, sob and cry and everything else. And sometimes you see people almost totally hopeless. And you start using the Word of God, preaching and explaining the Word of God and bringing them comfort. So like a calmness that comes onto that audience. Uh, I've seen it again and again, and it's amazing the impact of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit, I believe, uses the Word of God to bring us to Jesus, to bring sinners to conviction, to lead them to Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who uses the words of the Scriptures to bring people to an understanding. Otherwise, they will not understand. They may understand a need. They have a need for a God somewhere. Uh, and I believe that God can operate, and He does sometimes in the Muslim world, especially where there is um, no preacher to help them to know who Jesus is. And they may have had, they may have uh, have visions, or they may see visions, or have a dream about someone with with uh, marks in his hands coming to them, or something like that. And that has happened. We have testimony of that. But but by and large, uh, the Holy Spirit uses the words of the Word of God to bring people uh, to himself. Now, if we believe the Bible to be God's inspired word, then we will take seriously the task of studying the Bible. And what I want to do is um, to introduce you to a helpful approach to Bible study, something that I have personally found extremely helpful over the years. Um, and, and you can do it in a more technical way using the original languages um, but what I'm going to do tonight is really just to uh, introduce you to a very simple exercise uh, in trying to understand the Word of God. There's great value in reading the Scriptures and doing it so in a systematic way. And I want to encourage you, um, don't jump around in the Bible, don't read here and there and everywhere every day, um, but rather read systematically through the Bible. If you're a new Christian, I will not refer you to Leviticus. I've mentioned that a few times. <laughs> Um, but I'd rather refer you to one of the Gospels or First John or one of those where you can learn more about Jesus and who He is. Uh, 
And if you're an, an early or new Christian, uh, then start with the New Testament. Start with the Psalms, uh, those kinds of books. But ultimately, as you grow in your faith, you've got to read through the whole Bible because there's a whole context here. And if you don't read some of the books in the Bible, you actually diminish your faith and your understanding of the total picture, which is what I'm trying to do in this course. Ultimately, is take you through the whole Bible, book by book, in the next modules. And then as we come to the end, we say, okay, so what? We've been through the whole Bible. How does the whole picture fit together? Hence the title, The Big Picture. But having said all of that, uh, it is true to say that we often want more information or would like to understand more about the Bible. Not everything in the Bible is immediately apparent or clear. There are several things in the Bible that we don't necessarily understand at a very first reading, which is where study comes in. Now, last week I introduced you to Study Helps. Um, loads and loads of stuff on the internet and software and printed material, hundreds and thousands, maybe even millions of books that have been published uh, over the years. There are many Bible study methods um, that you can use, um, and I, I would encourage you to read up more. There have been books published just on Bible study methods, for example, um, and they introduce you to different kinds of ways in which you can study the Bible on your own. But what I'm going to do in terms of the method I'm, I'm teaching, just briefly introducing you to maybe tonight, is actually starting with the biblical text, the Bible text itself. Uh, before we start reaching out uh, for other helps. And I'm going to look at Romans chapter 1 uh, just briefly and introduce you to that later on. And what I want to point out right at the beginning is that I am not, even when I start, I, and for the first number of steps, I'll, I'll go through the steps in a moment, but for the first number of steps, I'm not using any other material but the Bible before me. Now, I will use other translations and make a comparison between the different uh, translations, but essentially it means just looking at the Bible itself. It's only once you've done your study in the Bible that you start reaching for other helps as well. I also understand that I have had some training uh, and experience in this field or in this regard, so I can't expect you to be at the same level. Uh, but I do believe that what I'm teaching you is fairly simple and straightforward and can be done by anybody. So let's look at the steps. Just looking at the words of the text itself. Number one, you need to determine the boundaries of the passage you want to interpret. You don't take the book of Psalms and try and interpret all 150 of them. It, it, will, it takes me sometimes two years just to read through the Psalms because I read them, uh, right now I read them slowly. I read uh, maybe a half a psalm, a quarter of a psalm. Sometimes if it's a short one, I read a bit. When I get to Psalm 119, uh, I read for 22 days or 24 days or 30 days long because I only read one little section. I underline uh, and so on. Now, you don't take a whole book or uh, five different stories in the life of Jesus and try and interpret them all. You take one story in the life of Jesus, one parable or a paragraph which makes, uh, constitutes a whole uh, in, let's say, the letters or when you get to some of the Old Testament books and so on. So number one, you need to determine where it starts. Now, all of that has been done for you by NIV and other translations. They have headings. Those headings are not inspired. They're not part of the Word of God. They have been added to help you uh, understand. Now, if I open it, Matthew, and I'm, I'm just opening randomly here, Matthew 25, for example, the heading says, The Parable of the Ten Virgins. It tells me what the story is going to be about. Now, those headings and the chapter and the verse divisions were not there in the originals. So, there are times when you may wonder whether the passage actually starts or begins there with stories like a parable or a miracle, or Jesus goes from here to there. It's very easy because you know the story starts here, it ends there. Uh, it's more difficult when you get to the epistles, uh, for example, and the prophetic literature uh, in the Old Testament. It's far more difficult. But again, it's been done by the NIV and other translations for you. Read the passage again and again. Read it several times. Use different translations. You will be amazed at how much of the passage actually begins to unfold just by reading a different translation. See how another translator has, has interpreted a particular word. We have looked at 2 Timothy 3.16 earlier on. Theognostos, neustos, uh, the, the word breathed out. Uh, in, a, in another translation you will read the word inspired. Uh, 
and another one inspired by God or breathed out by God. Just having those four or five different readings already gives you a sense of the range of meaning that there may be in one single word. That's step number two. Step number three, choose your study translation. It may be step number one as well, by the way. Uh, these steps are not necessarily always in the correct order. Uh, but choose your study translation. The more literal and dynamic ones work best. Now, last week I introduced you to that. So you're talking about New King James all the way to the NIV type translations. Um, you are not going to be able to do a proper study the, the way I'm doing it. And I'm going to introduce you in a moment uh, when you use the message. Because the message is a paraphrase. Uh, and, and you will see that very clearly when I do the translation in a moment. And then rewrite the passage using indents, arrows, and lines to indicate the relationship between the words, the concepts, but keep the word order intact. In other words, we're not changing the word order. We keep it as it is in the NIV or the in New King James or whatever version you're using. You're not changing the word order to suit your purposes. You, you simply do it word for word the way it is here. Nowadays, on my computer is relatively easy. I cut and paste uh, a passage onto a Word document, and then I simply use uh, Enter and, and uh, Tab uh, to, to do the tabbing. And I'll show you uh, roughly what I'm doing uh, a little bit later on. So by now, we've only looked at the words. We've read the words. We looked at it in different translations. We rewrote the words uh, to try and look at the relationship between uh, the words. And, and more about that in a moment. I just want to go through the steps first so that I don't lose you. Now, the next major section, steps five to nine, are really about the meaning. What you now do is you highlight the words that occur more than once. When, when, I, when I speak, uh, we, we speak using certain concepts to, to link sentences, to link paragraphs, and, and it's only over time that you start moving from one concept to another. I spoke about the epistles uh, just a moment ago, using that as an example of one of those more difficult places, although it's been done in the NIV for us, but to determine the actual paragraph or the section that I want to study. Now, let me give you a, 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 a simple braai illustration. Uh, you would find it very strange uh, if you have someone, uh, or you, you rock up at a braai, and, and a bunch of people stand around and they say something like, Yesterday, the Lions uh, messed it up again uh, with their rugby. Yeah, it was a wonderful sermon last week. And yes, so-and-so, a third person is saying, yeah, so-and-so is getting married next week. And the fourth person says, yeah, I'm flying out to the U.S. Uh, you know, two, two, two months from now. Nobody speaks like that. You speak like, and I'll give you the same illustration again, something like, the Lions messed it up yet again last night. I mean, it was so close. Yeah, says the next part. If, if only Yankees, you know, if only uh, he did this, that, and the other. Yeah, a third one says, you know, uh, and then they, they're going to play the Stormers next week. I mean, you, you can imagine what's going to happen there. You're talking about the Stormers, you know, uh, last week when I was in Cape Town, I saw um, whoever, you know, the captain of the team or, and so on. Yeah, talking about captains, you know, have you, uh, the, the, the other day I was on a ship and the, and the, and the ship, uh, uh, the, the captain uh, took a wrong turn. And uh, you, you get the point? One thing leads to the next, and we talk in paragraphs. Every conversation is in paragraphs. And that's the way the Bible is written. Paragraphs. It's not written in sentences. Now, of course, when you get to the book of Proverbs, it's a bit of an exception to the rule. But Proverbs is very different. And tonight, I'm not going to introduce you to the rules to interpret uh, Proverbs, for example, because it is a different genre, that word again. It's a different kind of literature type. And you need to interpret, interpret Proverbs as poetic type style material. And it's also wisdom material. And therefore you have wise sayings not always related to one another necessarily. But that's not the story when you read a story in Kings or in Matthew or in the book of Acts or wherever. Or even when Paul writes his epistles. He writes in paragraphs, in circles. And you have a circle. And he concludes the circle, but a concept gives rise to another concept. And another concept comes up. And uh, you'll see that in the, in the illustration I'm going to use now. Now, And I'll use a very easy one uh, to make it easy for me and for you. And then you need to link those paragraphs around those themes. What are the themes? Now, my Bri illustration is, is, um, is a good one. Because when you look at the Bri, there was the concept of, 
the paragraph, the circle, if you wish, of rugby. That was the, the theme. Now, maybe it moves to Western Province or Cape Town. Now, the next number of comments will have Cape Town as a theme. But something gives rise to the word captain, sea, ships. And you'll see the conversation moves like that. Now, I dare you, at your next braai, or wherever you sit, or even at your Bible study, listen. Just listen to the conversation. And you'll see how the conversation moves in a big circle. And you can actually identify paragraphs. That's the way people speak. That's the way I speak, and that's the way we all speak, and that's the way we write. And that's how, the way the Bible has been written for us. So what you now need to do is to look for those paragraphs, those links between the paragraphs, and how we can trace them. Uh, in step number five, by the way, if you look at the repeats of words, when a person repeats a word four or five times, you know that they want to say something. Let me give you, and again, it's an easy example. It's not always this easy. But let me give you just one example, and it comes from John chapter 17. After Jesus said this, listen carefully for repeats. He looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. You have, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. What is the one word that really occurred a few times? Glory, glorify. You think Jesus wanted to say something? I mean, you may have heard uh, eternal life here as well. Eternal life also uh, was repeated a couple of times. But, but essentially, I think five times in, in four verses. And you have the word glory or glorify or whatever. And, and so obviously the paragraph is about glory or glorify. The, 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 the prayer goes on. If you go through that prayer, and, and by the way, that's why how I prepare sermons. Uh, those become the points in a sermon. If I preach about John 17, the next part will be about unity. Jesus prays, let them be one. As you, Father, I, you and I are one. Let them be one. Unity, oneness. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of obvious. Now, those are easier examples, and I'm using the easy examples to prove the point. But if you go to some of the more difficult passages, something similar has happened. It's just not that easy to always uh, to see it. Once you've done the, the paragraphs, you've linked them, then you need to try and summarize every paragraph, uh, which I've just done. Something about glory. So obviously, glory is impor important here. Jesus' glory, God's glory, and God glorifying Jesus. So that's a summary of that paragraph. The next paragraph will be summarized by something like, uh, God wants us to be one, or God's desire for us is unity. Uh, you can summarize the paragraph in a statement, your own statement. You, you can use your own words uh, for that. Capture what is said in that paragraph. Step number eight, describe the flow of the argument, if you can. How did it happen? That, that Paul started over here, uh, he has some things to say in the middle, but he ends up over, over there. How did that all happen? Uh, if you can follow that argument. Sometimes it's a story. Now, stories are easier because they, they really un, uh, unfold uh, as they go along. Uh, sometimes um, in a parable, Jesus may actually give you the truth right at the beginning. The, the parable of um, praying regularly uh, where the widow goes to the judge. The, Jesus starts out by giving the truth. Then he tells a story. In many other places, he will tell a story like the sower and the seed. He tells the story, and then he explains what the story really means. So look for those clues and cues as you go through the story. What is the flow of the argument, the story, or the event? And then describe the essential truth. What is ultimately the one single thing that I can hold on to uh, in this particular passage? What is the essential truth? After you've done all of that, we're now step nine. And we're now moving through the last few steps, steps 10, 11, and 12. 10. Consult your commentaries now and other helps. You may come to some understanding of what this passage really means, but am I correct? I mean, at least we've got 2,000 years of Christian history and theologians and commentators who wrote on all these things, and those things are available now. So now I need to go and check. I, 
Uh, I can almost guarantee you, if you come up with something brand new in a passage, it's wrong. <laughs> because after 2,000 years of church history and Christian history, nobody can come up with brand new stuff on the Bible. Uh, I can almost guarantee you that. Now, if you come up with something that is maybe slightly different and you go and read the commentaries and you have a couple of comment commentators or books who actually agree with you, well, then you may be on to something. But if, it's, if nobody else agrees with you, then you're probably on the wrong track. So now you need to check and consult your commentaries. Make an application as step number 11 of your findings to your own life. Okay, so uh, up to this point in time, I have looked at what the Bible says. What did Paul say? What was the meaning of the psalm? What was it that God said to the people back then? It's only in step number 11 that we start saying, okay, well, what is God saying to me now? And that becomes more difficult and more challenging when you read through some of the laws, uh, like the Ten Commandments, for example. Uh, most of them are well applicable. When God says don't murder, He means don't murder. I mean, that's pretty clear. But when God says keep the Sabbath as a holy day, it becomes slightly more challenging for us to make the application. The direct application is not that open anymore. And I don't have time to elaborate. I wish I had, but I, I can talk for long just about the principle that we find in Sabbath keeping, which is no longer a law for Christians. No longer a law. But the principle that we find there, I think, is something that we should give more attention to. But, but now I believe it's a principle, not a legal requirement. But what is, what is the application of my interpretation? And then, your last step, and you may never really get here unless you lead a Bible study, or you need to do a talk somewhere, or you need to, become a, you, you need to preach a sermon somewhere. This is a step that comes fairly natural for, naturally for me, uh, because regularly I, I, I do the interpretation, which then results in a sermon, uh, which which is like a tip of the iceberg, if I can use that illustration. Uh, all of the steps up to this point is under the surface. And, and what I now bring into the pool, but it's not all my work that I've done. Uh, on average, it takes about eight hours to prepare one single sermon. Uh, and hopefully the pastor won't preach for eight hours. Um, sometimes it feels like they are preaching that long. Um, but, but, it, but, but ultimately, in a 30, 35-minute sermon, you need to deliver all the hard work that you've done in terms of the groundwork in order to get to that tip of the iceberg where you now either lead a Bible study or give a talk or preach a sermon. Now, by way of practical application, we're going to look at Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 4. And um, it's a short little passage uh, for two reasons. One, it's easy. And secondly, it's short uh, because I'm running out of space when it comes to pages. I do this on a regular basis. Uh, on a computer, I simply save them uh, under the book of Romans somewhere. Uh, and, and as I go along, I preach through, let's say, Ephesians. And so I've done the whole of Ephesians, this particular method. Uh, and as I go along, I've uh, recently I went to a camp and I, I spoke on Samuel, the life of Samuel, the person. And it obviously comes from First Samuel. And I've done the exact same exercise in several of the chapters in the book of Samuel. Uh, to try and help me to come to grips with what is said in the Bible. Because I honestly, seriously take the Bible seriously. Uh, to me, it's important to let the Bible speak to me, rather than just hear many different voices. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4 in the NIV, it's in your notes. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the passage, and I'm, I'm immediately stepping out of my own rules here, the passage doesn't end here, but I'm running literally out of space, and you will see that later on on the page. I, I don't have the space to actually continue, but one really should go to the end of, chap of, of verse 7. Uh, that is your rounded paragraph, um, and you'll see that in the heading in the NIV, uh, for example. Paul is still simply introducing himself, and when we look at um, letter writing in the first century A.D., um, in the third module, when we look at the New Testament, you will see uh, 
that this is a style of writing. Uh, I, I will write nowadays and say, uh, Dear Joan, um, it was so nice to be with you, um, and I'm going to do this, that, and the other, long, long sentence, two pages, right at the end, your sincerely or your loving husband or whatever, Gerard. So if she wants to know who wrote her the letter, she's got to turn to the back. Now, it was the reverse in the first century. You introduce yourself, I would say, um, I, Gerard, your husband, writes to you, Joan, and I bring you greetings, and I love you very much, or something like that. So up front, you introduce yourself and your, your reader, the recipient, up front. And that's exactly what Paul does over here. He introduces himself, and I'm only going to, to concentrate uh, and focus on those first four verses. Let's read it in the New King James Version. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, now, look at, at the New King James, brackets, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of from the dead, and then he continues from there. And as I said, I'm going to focus space wise just on those first four verses. Now, it's interesting doing the comparison between the more literal King James and the slightly less literal uh, uh, NIV. And then, if you read this in the message, one of the challenges in the message is that there are no verses, they are indicated in paragraphs, and that's the way Peterson wrote the message. And verse one is clear. It says, I, Paul, am a devoted slave of Jesus Christ on assignment, authorized as an apostle to proclaim God's word and acts. I write this letter to all the believers in Rome, God's friends. So what he really does is he brings forward verse 7. Verse 7 says, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. So Peterson brings verse 7 into verse 1 already. And then he summarizes and he puts together in different sentences. So this is one reason why you cannot, for this method, use the, method, the message. Because it's way too paraphrased and non-literal. But he says something like, the sacred writings contain preliminary reports by the prophets on God's Son. His descent from David's root, or David roots him in history. His unique identity as Son of God was shown by the Spirit when Jesus was raised from the dead setting him apart as the Messiah, our Master. Through him we receive both, both the generous gift of his life and the urgent task of passing it on to others who receive it by entering into obedient trust in Jesus. Now, I'm just reading that because I just want to get another perspective, but now I'm putting the paraphrase, I'm putting the message aside. And this is what I do. On a Word document, or you can do it by hand. I used to do it by hand. Nowadays it's far easier to do it on a computer. Um, but what I do is, I write, literally the NIV is rewritten, and I use literally the NIV. So I say, Paul, I enter, and I tab, and I say, a servant. Because Paul seems to be saying something about himself, a servant. But the servant is further qualified of Christ Jesus. And Paul writes more about himself. He says, I'm called to be an apostle. And he is also set apart for the gospel of God. Now, when you go back to the NIV, you will see there's a bracket that says, which... The which is a Greek word that refers to the gospel. Very clear. In Greek, you cannot make a mistake. You know that the reference is to the gospel because of the, the wording and the grammar that is used. Now, what the NIV does, it repeats the word the gospel. It's not repeated in the Greek. But it repeats it to make sure that you know he, Paul is now elaborating on the gospel. Now, look at the words. The gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand, through his prophets, in the Holy Scriptures, regarding his Son. The Gospel is regarding his Son. And the Son is who, as his human nature, was a descendant of David, who through the Spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. And he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, when I put the next slide on, I now start adding arrows and lines to indicate the relationship. I do this slowly, uh, when I do it myself, but it's obviously all prepared for you, and I'm not sure that this slide actually printed uh, in your notes, but this is what it looks like. I've now used color, uh, 
I, I can use color pens if I do it, if I print out the copy. Now I can play around with the copy. I don't do it in my Bible uh, because otherwise I may mess it up. So I print it out in the paragraph sort of section where I tabbed it, and then I start using lines and color, color pens or whatever. If I do it on computer, I simply just change the color of the words to indicate when words are either repeated or they are closely related to one another. If you look at this, Paul. Paul is saying something about himself. He's saying that he is a servant, he is called, and he is set apart for the gospel. He's a servant of Christ Jesus. He is called to be an apostle. He is set apart for the gospel of God. Now, it seems like his mind, this is the paragraph thing that I mentioned earlier on. He's now talked about the rugby. Now he's moving on to Cape Town. He has talked about himself as an apostle. Now he's moving on. He's talking about the gospel. Because the very mention of the word gospel introduces another thought in his mind. I, I think I've referred to this uh, already, but in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul actually starts saying something, and he takes 14 verses before he eventually says what he wants to say. Because he's doing this. He's tabbing. All, all together tabbing. All, the, all along. He's one thing gives lead to another, to another, and yet to another. And eventually he comes back to what he really wants to say. And so this is what is happening over here. So there he introduced the concept of uh, gospel by saying that he himself as an apostle is set aside, set apart for the gospel of God. This gospel God promised. When? Now I can ask questions of the passage as well. That's another way you can do Bible study. When, why, by whom, uh, where, what, and those kind of questions help a lot. In this particular case, God promised when? Beforehand. How? Through the prophets. Where? In the Holy Scriptures. So the gospel was promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Three things about the gospel. And what is this gospel? This gospel is about His Son. And you'll see the red words already. Christ Jesus, His Son, he is a descendant of David, he is the Son of God, and he is Jesus Christ our Lord. So just by looking for words that are connected and related to each other, you can find that. Now, he, the, the gospel is regarding his son. And then he elaborates on the son. Now he's into the third circle. First circle, Paul, who he is. Second circle, the gospel, what that is, and when it was promised. Third circle, this is now about Jesus. And his human nature, he was a descendant of David, Important concept, we can go on and on and on and elaborate on that. And through the spirit of holiness, or through the Holy Spirit is another possible translation, Jesus was declared, he was declared with power to be the Son of God. How did that happen? By his resurrection from the dead. And then his identity, Jesus Christ our Lord. And just by moving the, the, the sentences around, not, not changing the word order at all, but just indicating the relationship by paragraphs, lines, arrows, color, or whatever. It is almost like the passage becomes more alive. Now, all right, having done all of that, this is all very technical. It may sound or seem very technical. I personally don't think it's too technical. But what is the message of this all? I believe it's amazing. Uh, we, the book of Romans is such a wonderful book. We all know it, and we rush through the introduction. We want to get to the real meat of the letter. We want to get to the body of this, of this letter. And we miss some gems in the introduction, as, as I will point out now uh, in a moment. Some of the main themes that we find in, in uh, those verses, Paul's understanding of himself, he is a servant, he is called, and he's set apart. I can preach a sermon just on that. And if I were to go to a place where a new pastor is inducted or ordained, this is the kind of sermon that I will preach. Uh, see yourself as a servant. See yourself as being called by God. See yourself as being set apart for the gospel. It's a, it's a message I will preach even in this context. Uh, and in any context for that matter, because we should be servants of God. We should see ourselves being called into the kingdom of God to do kingdom business. We should see ourselves as being set apart by God to do His business and to live for His kingdom. I can go on and on and preach, but let me stop there. And then the second paragraph, the second circle, is the gospel. This is God's gospel. And again, I, I, I can preach about this, because so often Christians see the New Testament as a gospel, and the God of the Old Testament as a God of judgment. That was the error of Marcion. But Paul is very clear that it is God's gospel. 
It is God's good news. It is God who sent Jesus into this world. It is God who saved me. It is God who gave me grace so that I can be saved. It is God's gospel. It is God who gave it to the prophets, the message through the prophets beforehand. And the gospel ultimately, the contents of the gospel is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the good news. He is the gospel. So that's the gospel circle. And then we can elaborate thirdly, the third circle on Jesus. He's the son of David. There's significance in that title that he had when he was in the Gospels or when he's described in the Gospels. There is significance as Paul describes him as, as a descendant of David. The Jews regarded David as their king. And, and Jesus is the son of, of the king and therefore he is the Messiah. He is the son of God in that particular passage declared by God. And by the Holy Spirit. He, resurrect, he, he rose from the dead. He's the resurrected Christ. He is acknowledged by people around the world. He is Jesus Christ. He is Christ. He is Lord. Uh, and, and those are titles of Jesus Christ that you can use. Now, as you then go to the next steps uh, in terms of interpretation, now you can read commentaries for more information or your Bible dictionaries and so on. One of the things that will be important is background information about Romans. What, who is this book? Uh, who is this, this author, Paul? Um, why is he writing to the Romans? Who are the Romans? Where is Rome? All of that information will now come to light when you start reading up on that. Some of this you may have done already. Some of this may form an earlier step, but it will certainly introduce you to the book of Romans and the context and so on. Look up words such as gospel, set apart, apostle, spirit of holiness, uh, and so forth. And then ask yourself, how can I learn more about what Paul says uh, in this passage? In terms of application, I think I've done most of that already. But by now, you are so familiar with this passage, you can literally preach it. And, and this is why you need to almost saturate yourself with a passage. So that ultimately, it, the passage will speak through you. In other words, the word will speak through you, rather than you come there with all your uh, wild and, and weird ideas sometimes. The question is, how does this passage affect me or apply to me? And I've, I've made some comments about that in a mini-sermon that I preached uh, just a moment ago. A possible sermon outline will look like this. There's an introduction, changing the world. Um, and the world around us is changing. Uh, the theme can be the gospel is God's powerful way of changing the world. The body of the sermon can have those three circles. Uh, the gospel changed Paul. Who is Paul? The gospel is God's plan of salvation. And the gospel centers on Jesus Christ. The conclusion is, um, how does the gospel affect you? And, and how do you use the gospel to change the world around you? Your family, um, your business, your corporate environment, um, and so on. And, and that, that could be a very easy um, example. Now, I believe that this method can apply, be applied to many, many passages, most passages in the Bible. There are some exceptions to the rule, as I said earlier on. But I do believe that you can apply this. And I hope that you can now, I hope you have some time to actually go and play with this uh, method. If you next time, and, and use a short and an easy one to try and do that. And, and if you want to email that to me, uh, feel free to do so as well. Now, next week, I'm going to look at some of the rules and the guidelines that we follow in interpreting the Bible. I've done some of that today. Uh, but next week I will actually highlight those rules and interpretations. And the um, lecture next week will be shorter. It will be an hour and ten, an hour and quarter, um, roughly. And then we're going to take a tea break. And after that, those who write the exam will come back and write the exam. And the rest of you will be free uh, to go. Now, the, there's a copy of the exam time uh, guidelines available. Uh, please pick that up. It will help you to prepare for uh, the exam next week. And then I'll see you next week. God bless you.